I struggled greatly to find the words to begin this essay. Once in a great while, a powerful work of media, whether it be a book, game, TV show, movie, or song, falls onto your lap and changes the way you fundamentally think about art, love, and even life itself. I found myself in that very situation with the video game What Remains of Edith Finch. This game was recommended numerous times in the comments sections of my previous videos, so I knew it was worth checking out. If you were one of the people that recommended it, thank you. Edith Finch, in some respects, is hardly even a video game. It certainly doesn't adhere to the normal parameters that you might expect of one anyway. There are no character stats to develop, no enemies to fight, no items to collect, there isn't even much of a UI. I would go as far as to say that you don't even play this game, rather you experience it. Edith Finch isn't a game, it's so much more than that. It's like reading a short novel but getting to experience it in the first person. So if Edith Finch isn't exactly a game, why even play it? Why write this script or make this video? For those of you new to this project, I'm on a journey with grief after losing my 13 year old daughter to suicide last June. The purpose of the Love Yourself project is threefold. One, to honor and preserve the beautiful memory of my daughter. Two, to express my grief outwardly as a means of self-therapy. And three, to spread this important yet uncomfortable message to try to make the world a little less cold and lonely for others that struggle with grief, anxiety, emptiness, and depression. One way in which I've decided to do that is by playing video games with powerful, emotional, serious narratives and sharing my experience of looking at them through the lens of a bereaved parent. Welcome to Gaming with Grief. What remains of Edith Finch, or just Edith Finch as I will colloquially refer to it throughout this video, is a story-based game created by indie developer Giant Sparrow and released on multiple platforms as far back as 2017. The company's first game, Unfinished Swan, originally released five years prior and won two BAFTA awards the following year. Building off the success of their first game, the team expanded its horizons and pushed the creative boundaries of how a game could tell a story. Despite the company's notoriety, I had not heard of Giant Sparrow or Edith Finch prior to being recommended it. I'm quite grateful for that actually as this is one you should really go into blind. It goes without saying, but spoilers ahead. If you haven't played this game but think you might be interested, Stop this video right now. The game begins with the main character, Edith, sitting on the back of a ferry as it glides between a spattering of small, evergreen-dressed islands. Edith is on a deep, personal journey to revisit her childhood home, one occupied by five generations of her family, and reclaim some of the missing pieces of the Finch family history. So much of the family's legacy is shrouded in mystery, at least in Edith's mind, and as the last known living Finch, she is bound and determined to create a cohesive picture and remove the uncertainty. The Finch family immigrated to Washington State from Norway when Edith's great-great-grandfather Odin sailed over with the original Finch house in 1937 after the death of his wife and son. Believing that his family was cursed to meet early and untimely fates, Odin sought a better life in a new land. Unfortunately, his boat capsized off the coast of Orcas Island, drowning Odin and anchoring the house in the bay with only a small portion of its roof left visible. Odin's surviving daughter, Edith Sr., known as Edie, and her family build a new home and cemetery on the island and the Finch legacy continues. The game begins decades later when Edith arrives on the island and sets off down a thick forested path towards the house, narrating her journey along the way via journal entries. The game conveys its narrative using several different mediums, but this walk and talk style from Edith's perspective is the most common. I'll talk more about the others throughout the video. At this point, I was already immersed in this game's world. The swaying of the trees in the breeze, the soft chorus of the birds, the way the sunlight filtered lazily through the canopy. Though I have never been to the Pacific Northwest myself, much of this environment reminds me of my home on the southern shore of Lake Superior. This comfortable familiarity drew me in deeper as spending time in the splendor of nature has become a regular pastime for me in the wake of Ali's death. Edith arrives at the towering home untouched by any human for years. Lacking a key, she not so gracefully slips through the doggy door. We are given our first glimpse of the inside of the house, the kitchen. Dust particles float through the stagnant air, reflecting off the hazy sunlight. 
Countless cans of fish from the local cannery line the shelves. The room is in clear disarray, indicative of the occupants leaving in a hurry. The rest of the house reflects much the same. Edith meanders throughout the first floor, pausing to give the seemingly infinite number of sundries and knickknacks a bit of her attention. The Finch home is almost a museum in its own right, a time capsule of generations that have come and gone. There is no shortage of things to look at. As Edith explores the house, it becomes quickly apparent that many of its rooms have been locked or sealed off completely. We find out through Edith's narration that her mother, Dawn, began sealing up rooms following the disappearance of Edith's brother, Milton, in an attempt to shelter Edith from the burden of knowing about the family's supposed curse. Edith makes her way upstairs and enters the first bedroom, that of her uncle Walter. Each bedroom of the house is thematically unique, decorated in a way that represents each family member. If you pay attention to the details, you can gather a lot of information about their ages and personalities even before hearing their stories. Walter's room, although void of any furniture, is painted with an elaborate underwater scene, complete with sharks. Edith finds a door handle concealed within a fake book and opens a secret passage, the first of many. As she crawls through it, she notices Milton's art adorning the walls, a sure sign that he had been there before, likely without anyone else knowing. She enters the room of Molly, a third generation Finch who would have been Edith's great aunt. Despite Molly dying in 1947, the room seems nearly untouched by time, still oversaturated in pink princess decor. Edith examines the first of many shrines, small memorials dedicated to the late family members. It's here that we get our first taste of this game's storytelling prowess. Assuming the role of Molly decades in the past, we find ourselves awake late at night. Molly recounts being sent to bed without supper and wakes up hungry, prompting us to search for something for the 10-year-old to eat. I'm going to pause quickly and warn you that if you're an empath as I am, this part of the game may be hard to watch, as will many to follow. Knowing how incredibly precious daughters are and having lost mine, my heart broke for Molly during this sequence. Molly starts by eating a dried old piece of half-eaten gerbil food from the cage, not even seeming to mind the taste. She makes her way to the window, where her windowsill is lined with decorative holly. As soon as the prompt to eat the berries appeared, I knew what was going to happen and had to stop for a second. In case you aren't aware, holly berries, despite their bright red color and luscious appearance, can make humans, especially young children, very ill. I didn't want her to eat them, but I knew I had no choice. Upon consuming the berries, Molly tells us that she begins dreaming. Perhaps a poisoned-induced hallucination, she opens up her window to pursue a bird on an outlying tree branch. She changes shape into that of a cat and continues to gracefully traverse the twisted branches and moonlit house until finally catching and eating the bird. She then transforms into an owl, flying over a snow-covered forest and hunting rabbits. After the owl, she becomes a shark, flailing through the woods until eventually reaching the ocean. After hunting a seal, she transforms again, this time into some sort of long-tentacled sea monster straight out of an H.P. Lovecraft novel. After stealthily dispatching a couple of unsuspecting humans, she crawls through a pipe only to emerge back in her bathroom and creeps under her own bed. The dream ends and Edith, having learned about Molly's death, annotates this in a family tree drawn in her journal. This cycle is how most of the game plays out. Edith explores the house, often by way of secret passages, finds a shrine of deceased family members within their rooms, and we are given a replay of each Finch's demise as told through their eyes. While I won't cover every member of the Finch family in this video, giving you, the viewer, further incentive to go play this game for yourself, I'll highlight some of the noteworthy ones that resonated with me the most. Let's pause and discuss this game's art. If I had to use one single word to describe Edith Finch's art style, it would be ambient. Now let me preface this by saying that this game's art style is not so steeped in high-def realism that you would confuse it with reality, but that's to the game's credit, not its detriment. You see, it doesn't need any more realism than it has, and to me, one single more pixel of definition would detract from the meticulously crafted whimsy of this world. Not only that, but the art style is able to shift itself as if it were a chameleon, perfectly synchronizing with the different ways in which each Finch recounts their history. It's apparent that this game's art was truly a labor of love, and its charm has no end. Contributing further to the game's art style are its lighting effects. 
Utilities like lens flaring and ray casting have been around for decades, but Edith Finch does something truly special with them. The game's lighting knows when to dial itself up and highlight objects and environments, and when to dull itself to create hazy, visual uncertainty. Playing this game feels like a dream, and I mean that fully and sincerely as a compliment. I often find myself having to stop what I was doing and just take everything in. The way the moon's soft beams blanket the house, the way certain memories are draped in a soft sepia tone. I was actually a little surprised to learn that this game is seven years old. The team, especially Brandon Martinowicz, did a truly commendable job and mark my words, this game's art will hold up years from now. After exploring her great grandma Edie's room, Edith enters the adjoining bathroom. She finds another secret passageway in a nook above the toilet and crawls through it, entering the room of her grandfather Sam and his twin brother Calvin. The boys' room is divided down the middle and again, their personalities and interests are reflected in the decor. Sam's half sports a proud, patriotic military theme. The backdrop is painted to resemble the walls of a military outpost, classic recruiting posters and American flags line the walls and shelves, and the bed is still dressed in camouflage sheets tucked in tightly enough to bounce a quarter off of. As a veteran myself, I found a lot of charm in Sam's side of the room. Calvin's half of the room takes a departure from the grounded realism of the military and instead favors the fantasy of space exploration. In contrast to Sam's Enlist poster, Sam's posters depict rockets, planets, and the message, Explore the Universe. Edith removes the velvet rope, cordoning off Calvin's side of the room and walks up the steps to enter the command center, a windowed nook above his bed. Edith finds herself especially interested in Calvin's story because her mom, Sam's daughter, never talked about him. Calvin's shrine, a note from Sam inside a toy astronaut helmet surrounded by half-melted candles, takes us into another flashback. Back in 1961, Sam's letter recounts Calvin's determination, or perhaps stubbornness. We find ourselves as Calvin, one foot in a cast, swinging on an old tree swing while Sam takes photographs from the cliffside. During the swing session, Sam and Calvin's mom calls the boys in for dinner. Heeding his mother's call, Sam runs to the house, but Calvin continues to swing, higher and higher until eventually taking off and soaring over the cliffside. Unfortunately, Calvin's imagination was not a reality, and he plummeted off the cliff. Sam, heartbroken and traumatized, became quiet and reclusive. He enlisted at age 18 and apparently never looked back. Sam's note discusses some of the tragic what-ifs, a common pitfall of those in grief, myself included. Though serving no real purpose in one's healing, the human mind has a way of fixating itself on past events, the things we could and should have done differently, the things we only see in hindsight that we pour countless amounts of energy into wishing we could undo. We all have regrets, but mine have become especially heavy since my daughter's death. I wish I had checked on her one more time before bed. I wish I had stayed up a little bit later. I wish she had just come and knocked on my door and said, Dad, I'm not okay. Maybe she'd still be here with me if so. But again, this way of thinking is a slippery and dangerous slope and does me no good. Keep this in mind if you find yourself ruminating on your own what-ifs. Edith continues on her journey through the labyrinthian house, exploring more hidden passages and unearthing the history of her late relatives. There's Barbara, her grandpa Sam's older sister and a former child star whose death, presumed to be an attack by her boyfriend, is artistically exaggerated as a stylized 1960s comic book. There's Gus, Edith's uncle, a young rebel who refuses to quit flying his kite during a powerful windstorm and is crushed to death when a giant wooden totem topples over onto him and Gregory, another of Edith's uncles who drowns in the bathtub as a baby. The death of every finch is downright tragic in its own right, but then again, I suppose that's the nature of death, isn't it? The mystery and finality of it are hard for us to grasp as humans. The experience of my daughter's death, including finding her body, has shown me just how precious, fragile, and fleeting life can really be. I think that's one of this game's most prominent messages. Somewhere along the way, society teaches us that we're going to die old and wrinkled in a warm bed surrounded by all of our loved ones, but rarely does death offer us that luxury. Death would not be such a moving experience if it were that predictable. Tomorrow is never promised. Let's pause from the narrative to talk about this game's music, which, as many of you know by now, 
is a critical piece of the gaming experience for me. Edith Finch's soundtrack was composed by Jeff Russo of TV's Fargo fame. Much of the game's sound design focuses on soft, elongated piano chords that evoke a quiet sadness. The titular Edith's theme reminds me of a lonely moonlit walk, the kind you take when you don't have a destination in mind and just need to walk. The track you will likely hear the most, The House, follows suit with an echoing melody that creates a gentle ambience, appropriate for exploring an old home steeped with a forgotten history of deep sorrow. A powerful string and flute arrangement rises, a perfect companion to the visual experience of seeing such a beautiful, unique house that has been abandoned. The Finch stories that have chapters, such as Molly's Dream or Lewis's Coronation, are given multiple tracks, each fitting seamlessly over the transitions in their narratives. I love it when games do this, add layers or subtle changes to the music when the gameplay warrants. Perhaps the earliest example of this that I can think of is the percussion added to the tracks in Super Mario World when riding Yoshi. It adds a subtle yet important level of detail that I really appreciate. Though only 17 tracks in total, Edith Finch's soundtrack is nothing short of a masterpiece and fits the identity of this game perfectly. My advice to those of you planning to play this game is to stop and pay attention to the details in each room of the house, including the music. Edith eventually finds her way into her Grandpa Sam's new room where we are given his story. After his military service, Sam returns to Orca's Island where he is married and has Dawn, Edith's mother, and her two uncles. One day, Sam takes Dawn, now a young teen, on a remote hunting trip. I really enjoyed how this story was conveyed from an artistic standpoint. Instead of playing as Sam, we play primarily as Dawn, taking pictures with her father's old camera. Even though we understand at this point that we are watching Sam's final minutes, his impending end is brushed aside by the moments of levity, such as Dawn taking a picture of him while he pees on a tree. Sam and Dawn remind me of my relationship with my daughter. Me, the military dad who, despite being rigid at times, loves nothing more than quality time with my kids. And Allison, who, like Dawn, was always making a joke of things to try and lighten the mood. After shooting a buck, Sam runs over to console the clearly upset Dawn and snap a picture with her trophy when the deer awakens and bucks him off the cliff. As if shooting the deer wasn't traumatizing enough for Dawn, she now has to carry the immense weight of her father's death. I believe it was this moment in which Dawn really started to believe in the Finch family curse and vowed to keep her children sheltered from it, at least to some degree. Now, I know I'm skipping over several of the Finches, but again, I strongly urge those of you interested in the story to go play the game for yourself. That said, there's no way I can forego discussing Lewis. Lewis's room, converted from an old boat, shows that he was, well, we'll say laid back. Though a bit unbound, Lewis clearly cared a great deal for Edith, and she remembers him very fondly. The two of them played video games together often, despite Lewis not being very good. This is a pastime that I shared with my daughter quite a bit, an album of memories in my mind that I will always treasure. The way Lewis's story plays out is one of the longest and perhaps the most unique. Despite struggling with his mental health, Lewis gets a job at the cannery, which explains all of the canned fish we saw when we entered the kitchen. As the narrative plays out in a form of a letter from Lewis's psychiatrist to his mother, we take the helm as Lewis, cutting the heads off fish at his job. This task is simple enough at first. You merely move his right hand with the right stick while listening to the story. But in perfect, and I mean perfect, artistic execution, this task becomes more complicated as Lewis becomes more out of touch with reality. While still controlling his right hand and cutting the fish, we must now also control his imaginary D&D style avatar as we navigate his imagination. As Lewis delves deeper into this part of his mind, the game becomes more complex gaining dimension, sailing a ship while making story-based choices, and finally ascending a golden staircase, which, in reality, is the cannery where Lewis commits accidental suicide. This one was especially hard on my old heart for obvious reasons. As brutally painful as it was to experience, I have to laud Giant Sparrow for the insanely creative way in which they told Lewis's story. Edith eventually returns to her own room and the final memory plays. 
we are shown the last night in which a finch occupied the house. We find Edith, Dawn, and Edie seated at the table eating dinner. Dawn and Edie begin arguing about the plans to leave the house the following day when Edith is excused from the table. She sneaks into the library where she finds a book, The History of the Finches, written by Edie with the intent of sharing with Edith the family legacy that her mother is so vehemently withheld from her. Edith begins reading about the night she was born. The tide was low, the lowest in years, so low that the original sunken house was exposed. Edie stumbled through the fog, trying desperately to enter the old house one last time, but just as she reaches the house, Dawn enters the room and pries the book from Edith's hands, ripping it in half. They depart the house in the darkness of night, leaving Edie behind. She passed away before she was supposed to be picked up the next day. Edith explains that she and her mother moved around as she continued to grow up, but after a few years, Dawn fell ill and also passed away, presumably to cancer. Edith, revealing herself to be pregnant, shares that this entire narrative, written from her perspective, is intended for her unborn child. True to the Finch family curse, Edith pays the cost of delivering her baby with her life. Her journal, though narrated by her voice, is actually being read by her son, Christopher, as he places white lilies on Edith's grave. Her son and her legacy are what remain of Edith Finch. I don't think I've ever played a game with this much beauty juxtaposed with this much sorrow. Edith's final words to her son, I want you to be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all, summarizes this game's message perfectly. Now that might sound odd coming from me, a dad who lost his most special girl in a truly horrendous way, and I agree to an extent. It is odd to have even a speck of gratitude for my life in the wake of her death, but I do. I do because again, I've seen firsthand how quickly and easily life can be taken away from us. As I've said before, life isn't all good, but it's not meant to be. That's part of the deal. I'm not trying to deliver some empty platitude about looking at the glass half full, but there is value in trying to see the good in life. You see, I am now shouldered with the burden of living two lives, one for myself and one for my daughter who isn't here to experience life for herself anymore. Because of that, I try to be more present for the little things in life because, as it turns out, they're actually the big things. If you think back to the pleasant core memories of your younger days, you probably don't think much about the money or stuff involved. You likely think about the people and environment that enrich those memories. I think about walking into my backyard as a kid, our lilac trees swaying in the warm summer wind as my mom hung clothes on the line to dry. I think about sitting cross-legged on the floor, playing trouble with my daughter until my hips and knees hurt. I can still hear the sound of that bubble popping in my head. Moments like these are what life is truly about. Once this life is done, it's done. We don't know what comes next. So please, even if your life is difficult right now, even if a terrible tragedy has befallen you, know that you are important, that you are loved, and that there is some goodness ahead of you if you just keep going. Thank you so much for watching this video. I am so incredibly moved by all of the support you've given me and my family since I began the Love Yourself Project. I'm enjoying creating these videos a lot and have a big list of games I'm working on, but please, don't hesitate to leave more suggestions for games you'd like me to play. As always, be patient, be kind, and love yourself. See you soon.